Our text today is found in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, but we will travel to a, a few different areas before we read Hebrews 7, 1 through 10. Let's pray. Father, Lord, please, by the name of your Son, Jesus, be with us. Amen. Hey, Trinity, will you grab my water? Forgive me. <clears throat> Our theme for this Lord's Day is who or what is Melchizedek? Alistair Begg says that if you're preaching topical sermons, you don't preach this text. This is not something that you would say, hey, I want that's it. That's the one I want to preach. That, this is what I want to bring to people's attention. And he says, if you expositionally walk through the text, this is one of the spots of the Bible that you wish that you could skip over without the Bereans in your audience, in the congregation, noticing. It's a hard per, uh, portion of Scripture. Our proposition is, since Jesus is our high priest and king forever, we have no need to look for another, right? Jesus is our high priest and king forever. We have no need to look for another. And today, this day, if you will give me your attention, my intentions are to show you Christ by way of this king, priest, who is called Melchizedek. In our outline, we will see Melchizedek compared to the Son of God. Not the Son of God compared to Melchizedek, as some people like to teach, but Melchizedek compared to the Son of God. The context of our portion of Scripture is found in Hebrews 4, 14 through 6, 5, 1 through 14, and 6, 1 through 3. And here's what I want you to notice from the context. That Jesus is our high priest, right? Hallelujah, holla back. Jesus is our high priest. That Jesus is able to sympathize with our weakness. Why? Because Jesus took on flesh. We can have, you and I can have confidence when we draw near to him. Now, he was appointed high priest by his father. Not by anyone else, but by his father. God the Father. That he was made perfect through suffering. Not morally perfect, but that the life that he lived it perfectly satisfied the wrath of God. And that he, Jesus, is the source of eternal life. Anyone, if anyone is to have eternal life, they must come to Jesus Christ. He is the source. There is no other source. It's him alone. He's the only way to the Father. And that he was designated by God as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Last thing, that the hearers of this letter were hearing, but they were not listening. Right? You remember we went over that. So let's look at the context real quick. We'll begin in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us 
with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated He is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for the sins of of those people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And as he's also said in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal life for all who obey him. Being designated by God as high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 11. About this, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain. So about what? About Melchizedek. About Melchizedek, we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you yourself need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness because he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their, who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice in distinguishing good from evil. Chapter 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Let us leave the gospel for a minute and go on to Melchizedek. That's what it's saying here. Not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and instructions about washings, the laying on of of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. The teaching of Jesus and the high priesthood being after the order of Melchizedek is where the Hebrew Christians need it to go. And it is where we will go today. We need to go. We will go today. The church has always been a place where both... We have both those who are ready for solid food and those who are not ready for solid food. The problem is, is most churches neglect those who are ready for solid food by never getting into real teaching. They only feed milk. But there's the opposite too, where there's no solid food and there's no milk. There's stories about the pastor's life. We want to be a church that does both. We give the gospel every week and we teach holy rot. Because it is by the the milk of the gospel that men are saved and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the message. Let's uh, look real quick at that message. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is what Paul is pointing to when he's, when, he's, when he's speaking about milk. I want you to listen. How, how important is this milk? 
How important is it for me when, our, when, 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 when the babies come to feed them milk? We don't shove steak in their mouth when they're babies. They need milk. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll look at verses 1 through 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Here it is. For I receive, for I deliver to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The church needs that every week. I would say that a church that does not teach that every week has fallen from what the Bible gives us to, to live on. But again, this, this is something that, that, that came to me, I wrote down, that came to me as I was thinking about this, and it, was, it is this, you will never be able to articulate the depth of the gospel without understanding the teachings around the gospel. Paul Washer says that, Thousands and thousands and ten thousand years in heaven, we will no, no more be at the foothills of the gospel of how the depth is of it. I, I might be paraphrasing that and saying it wrong, but, but he's talking about the, the, that the gospel itself is it, it's so much there. There's so much to understand. And our problem is, is that we will never fully understand it. And so we need it every week. Every waking moment, we need the gospel. But we also need the teaching in the scripture that surrounds the gospel, that makes the gospel clearer. And that's what I hope to accomplish with this hard portion of text. Much ink has been spilt on identifying the relationship between Melchizedek and Jesus. And there are extra biblical writings such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and Second Maccabees that can leave you thinking, quite differently from the what I believe the biblical interpretation is. Some believe Melchizedek to be a Christophany, a pre-incarnate Christ. So Christophany is when you're reading the Old Testament and you see places in the Old Testament where Jesus is revealed. We saw this last week in the Old Testament dealing in Genesis chapter 3 dealing with the angel of the Lord. As, as Abraham has lifted his hand against his son to come down and to sacrifice his son, it says the angel of the Lord called to him, Abraham, Abraham, do not hurt your son. So in Scripture where we see the angel of the Lord, we see this as a Christophany. That this is... that that this is Jesus being revealed before his, his incarnation. But people seem to think that this is a pre-incarnation of Christ. And they're calling it a Christophany. And I'll, and I'll dive deep into that momentarily. So the question is, who or what is this? Melchizedek, and I'm going to give you my interpretation. It's very simple. I believe him to be a type of Christ. Remember, we're going through covenant theology. We have types and antitypes. Remember the, the illustration of the menu. We, we have a picture of a burrito, but it's not the burrito. As a matter of fact, in order to get the picture, they had to take a picture, with the camera, they had to take a picture of a real burrito. So I believe that this, this Melchizedek is a picture. He is a type of Christ. He is not Christ. He is a picture. He is a type. 
and that Jesus is the antitype. This making him not a Christophany, but just someone who resembles Christ. And I will, and on that statement, allow me to build my case. First, we see Melchizedek appear in Genesis 14. So he only appears in the Old Testament twice, Genesis 14 and in Psalm 110. And in short, when it comes to Genesis 14, the context, there was, there was a battle and Abraham's kinsman, Lot, was taken. So Abraham took 318 of his trained men to rescue Lot. Now, these are not Navy SEALs, right? <laughs> these are shepherds. These are people working in the field that know how to throw a punch. So don't think Navy SEAL. Don't think Marine when he says trained men. These are just men who can fight, men who were willing to fight. Now, after Abraham returned from the battle, he met with Melchizedek. And we'll pick up right there in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, just for the sake of time, we'll read verse 18 through 20. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. So he's on his way from the battle, and it says, verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed God Most High, who was, and he said, and Blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now turn your attention to Psalm 110. There's only seven verses, and we'll read all seven. So this is the most quoted passage of Scripture in the New Testament. Nothing is quoted more than Psalm 10. Seven verses, but it speaks about a king and a priest. And it's a psalm of David, a psalm of David, David being king, the earthly physical king of Israel. And he says, the Lord, Yahweh here, notice the all caps, says to my Lord, Adonai. The Lord Yahweh says to the king's Lord, Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord Yahweh sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in your holy garments. From the womb of the morning to the dew of your youth, will be yours. The Lord has sworn he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord Adonai is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter the chest, scatter the chest, over the wide of the earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. By, by the way, therefore, he will lift his head. Now let's go to our text. Hebrews chapter 7. We will read verses 1 through 10. 
have in mind, I know it's going to be hard, but have in mind everything that's been said. Just, just put it all there as I read this. Verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham appropriated a tenth part of everything. He was first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem. That is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils? And those descendants of Levi who received priestly offerings have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also are also. All these also are descendants from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And in one case, tithes are received by mortal man, but in the other case, by one who it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when he met, when Melchizedek met him. All right, things that you might have noticed, and these will be our sub points. Sub point one, he is a priest of God most high. So point two, Melchizedek is the king of Salem. So point three, he is without genealogy. And so point number four, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And we'll just jump right in it for the sake of time. So point number one. He is a priest of God Most High. We see that in verse 1. Let's read verse 1 again. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the, Most High, of, Mo, of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. All right, notice how this Melchizedek is both king and priest. All right, I pointed that out earlier that that this, I believe, is a clear type when it comes to typology. Jesus is both king and priest. This is something that we don't see in the Aaronic priesthood. So the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, are just priests. They are not kings. Kings come from Judah. Priests come from Levi. The Levitical priesthood are descendants of Levi, not of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, and yet he is priest. And as we transition, Melchizedek is the priest of God Most High. This is God Most High. This is El Elyon. El being the Old Testament word for God, Elion, Most High. This is telling us that, that God was at work and established before He establishes the covenant with Abraham. And we listen, we know this is true. Thank Jake, I mean, thank Job, right? Who did Job worship? And Job was before Abraham. God has always been at work. He's never been without a people who worshiped him. Job was a worshiper of God. This Melchizedek, whoever he is, was a worshiper of God. So knowing biblical history, 
What the writer is doing, in my opinion, he is showing that there are two priesthoods who worshiped God Most High, El Elyon. So point number two. Some of these will be faster than the others. So point number two. Melchizedek is king of Salem, verse 2. And to him, Abraham appropriated a, t- a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. The writer of this book has given us insight to his name, that his name means king of righteousness. His name is broken down in Hebrew as Melak and Zadok. Melak is king, Zadok is righteousness, king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And he's te- this is telling us that this Melchizedek, this Melak Zadok, was a king, was a righteous king. And that this king would have established a righteous kingdom. And it also says that he is also king of Salem. And it says that is king of peace. Salem, Melchizedek, Salem would have been Melchizedek's city, the city that he was a king of. And and, and Salem, this, this city is probably known by another name that's familiar to us, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Salem is what I believe to be Jerusalem. And we, you come to this conclusion when you look at Genesis 14, 18, uh, Hebrews 7, 1 through 2, and you compare that to Psalm 76, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. This is really cool. Psalm 76, verse 1 and 2. It says, In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode is established in Salem. His dwelling place in Zion. So the the Hebrew term for Salem can mean peace. The Hebrew term for Salem can refer to peace or it can refer to Salem, the place. So Salem can be peace or it can be the place and the place is now known as Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It is where we get the word shalom. Salem is where you get the word shalom. Shalom means peace. So what I believe the author is doing is he, he's just trying to unscramble the eggs, right? And I'll explain that more in a minute. What I believe the author is, is doing is, 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 is that The author understands the name Melchizedek to mean king of righteousness and the title of his name to mean king of peace as seen in 7.2. The combination of the terms righteousness and peace has messianic implications that's only found in the Old Testament. And the understanding of this helps us to see why Melchizedek has such a prominent role in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Now, as we transition, I believe these things are pointing us, you and me, to our righteousness and to our peace. Again, this is a type, uh, what the writer is doing, he's looking at Melchizedek, a figure that these Jewish followers of Christ would have known. And he is saying that, that just as this king back here, who our forefather paid tithes to, was, was king and priest, just Jesus is king and priest, and, 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 and just as he had this righteousness about him and this peace, that this righteousness and peace can be only found in Jesus. Because Jesus is our peace. We can only have peace in Christ alone. So point three. 
this is where it gets a little tricky. He is without genealogy. Verse 3. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues priest forever. This verse is where interpretations can get wonky. I know this because I've had some wonky interpretations because of this verse. I've, I've, I've thought some weird things because of this verse, right? And let me tell you, when I was talking about there was ink spilt on this subject, there are some weird things written because of this verse. But now, after you know, being in Hebrews and studying, I believe that this verse is the main verse that teaches my interpretation, that it's typology. Him being without father or mother or genealogy, having neither uh, beginning of days nor end of life, is speaking of the fact that He does not appear in Scripture before Genesis 14. Like, it doesn't tell you who His mom and dad is, nor that there's a backstory of His birth, or do we read of His death. So you... There's nowhere in Scripture where it says, and so and so beget Melchizedek, and Melchizedek beget so and so, and then Melchizedek dies. Like, it's just not in Scripture, right? And at this time, there was a Jewish interpretation that said that he, listen to this, that Melchizedek was Shem. So the Jews believed that Melchizedek was Shem. You say, who's Shem? Noah's son. One of Noah's sons' name was Shem. And so the, a, the, the, a Jewish belief was that this priest, this Melchizedekian priesthood, that this guy was Shem. And that because of this, that it is only a title. The name Melchizedek is only a title. It's not his name. And yet the writer says, by translation of his name, he is king of righteousness. The Jews interpreted that this Melchizedek was Sham. And when you hold the interpretation that this is a title, which the LDS church does, and now they, when, whenever they ordain people, it's to the ordination of, of uh like to them, you cannot baptize someone unless you are of the Melchizedek priesthood. So you see these, the, these guys, they walk around here and they knock on your door. They are people that has been ordained into the Melchizedek priesthood. So to them, Jesus is not the only priest of this order. They're, they also hold to the priesthood of Melchizedek because they hold it as a title just like the Jews do. That this is Sham. Now, this is my opinion. I believe it can only mean, like the text says, that it's he just has no genealogy. Like, like, like when you read the Bible, you, you just don't read anything about him. There's nothing there. He appears, and then he's, he doesn't appear again to, to Psalm 110. And then after Psalm 110, he doesn't appear again to, to uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Like he's just not there. And I believe the, the, the writer is just saying that. He, he is speaking against the Jewish interpretation that he's Sham. Why? Because Sham has a genealogy. If the Jews at this time are teaching that he's Shem and our writer is teaching that he had no genealogy, he can only be teaching that he's not Shem. This is something that the hearers of this time would have known. But unless you dig, you come out with some wonky interpretations. And trust me, I've been doing some digging. <laughs> it's kept me up at night. Now, I believe the writer is actually clearing the table, right? He is, he, when it comes to these Jewish fables, he is unmixing the egg. Man, y'all got it all mixed up. 
And, and, and there's another Jewish fable. We'll get to that in the, at the last point. The last part of this verse, though, it tells us that he was a type. I want you to see it. The last part of this verse, where it says, but resembling. So verse 3, the last part. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. That he, Melchizedek, resembles God. Notice it doesn't say that he was the Son of God or that he, present tense, is the Son of God. It just says, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So the word resembles here means looks or seems like. He looks or seems like. This is what a type is. That's all Melchizedek is. He seems like the son of God. He, he, he looks like, I mean, when he, when he came out to Abraham, what did he bring? Bread and wine. Now, I'm not saying there's something spiritual there, or unique, but he looks like. He resembles the Son of God. Well, how? Because, I mean, if, 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 if you just look at the idea of Jesus and the genealogy, Jesus has a genealogy. I mean, not in the eternal state, right? Jesus says God doesn't have a genealogy, but the man Christ Jesus does. All it's telling us is that this guy is not Shem, and he resembles Stop, stop going crazy with your fables and your myths. He's, he just resembles the Son of God, though he is a higher priesthood than the order of the priesthood of Aaron. He's greater. He's superior to the priesthood of Aaron. Why? Because Abraham gave him a tenth. And to be honest, my biggest problem with making him a Christophany is the fact that by saying this, we would have to say that Jesus, prior to the incarnation, had an earthly kingdom on earth before the call of Abraham, where he would have been both king and priest. To say that he, this is a pre-incarnated Christ, you're saying that Jesus had two incarnations, and the first one failed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's blaspheming. That goes against the gospel. Because it says he was king of Salem, Jerusalem, on earth. We cannot go that route. The text doesn't allow it. And as we transition, I would like to point out that the Paschal Lamb pointed to Christ, that it pointed to Jesus, that the man, that the manna, mamma, manan that came down from heaven pointed to Jesus, that the bronze serpent that, that was on the pole pointed to Jesus. These things, like Melchizedek's, are shadows pointing to the substance, that they are not the substance. He is nothing more than a type, a picture of something that was that, uh, something was going to come that's greater. Something is coming that he resembles, and that's it. That's it. That's all it talks about. That's all it, that's all it is with him, other than him being a greater priesthood. To quote Alistair Begg, if you follow me on Facebook, you've seen this, to cling to the shadow, you forfeit the substance. If you're focused on the shadow, if that's where your hope is, you have forfeited the substance. The substance is Christ. The something greater that all things in Scripture point to are Christ. Sub point number four. Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. This is found in verses four through ten. So how great, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> see how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And to those descendants of Levi, he, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes 
from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are a descendant of Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In one case, tithes are received by mortal man, but the other case by one of whom it testifies that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, pay tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when he met him. All right, so Abraham, on his way back from the battle, having with him the possessions of the four kings that fell. So these kings came in, they took, they took, uh, 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 you know, they captured people and they took what the people had. Abraham takes his men and he goes and he defeats these kings supernaturally, in, in my opinion. Uh, what takes place. He's got four kings and armies and his 318 men defeat them. And return, and, and as he returned home, he was met by Melchizedek. And to him, this, this king, this, this priest, this king priest, he, Abraham, gave a tenth of everything that he brought back. So, so all the spoil that he brought back from this war, he gave it to this priest this this king priest that's what this that's the context of the verse uh, of, of verses four through ten now I believe what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that this Melchizedek priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood because the Melchizedek did not come from Abraham and Abraham gave this Melchizedek priest king, Tithes, a tenth of everything that he had. So much so that Abraham, the Levitical priesthood, you know, he paid this tithe to, to, to him, and the explanation is, is how, why did this happen? Why is, is this Melchizedek greater than the Levitical priesthood? Because the Levitical priesthood is of the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi is from Levi, the son of Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, and Isaac is the son of Abraham. And so he's, he, he, he's just showing the superiority when, 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 when it comes to blessings. The, the, the blessing will be passed down from father to son, basically. The father was the, was the superior. The son would be the inferior. And you have this... This, this Melchizedek, who's not even in the line of Abraham, who, who blesses Abraham. And then through him, his offspring are blessed. His offspring are given tithes. This is really hard to explain. <laughs> Because you got because it has that one verse in it that that they pay tithes because he was in the loins of his father, I mean his of his ancestor, and so just trying to 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 comprehend that and wrap your mind around it is, is is really tough. So this is what I believe. So because they are Abraham, I'm, excuse me. So because they are from Abraham, they too pay tithe. I just believe it like it's it's that simple. It's not really trying to say something weird or, or anything like that, but because the, Levit the Levitical priesthood, so, so this is why the Melchizedek priesthood is greater, is because the Levitical priesthood are descendants of Abraham, and Abraham paid him tithes. Speaking that Abraham in this moment was the inferior, and him being the superior. And it was all of this was to show that the Levitical priesthood is inferior to the priesthood that Jesus holds, being that Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it's really tough. So 
because this Levitical priest line is, it comes from Abraham and they were in Abraham when he paid. So because of that, the, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek is superior and they are inferior. In order to enter the Levitical priesthood, this is really cool. In order to enter the Levitical priesthood, you would begin training for the priesthood at 25. And you, would, and, and, and you would enter the priesthood at the age of 30, and you could be a priest only until the age of 50. So you would train for it at 25, you would enter at 30, and you can only be that until you were 50. And... Uh, Chapter seven, verse twenty-three tells us that how, another that, that that they were prevented by death. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in the office. And when you look back in history, they can only be a priest until they were fifty. The, at the inauguration of the priesthood, they would wash you, they would anoint you, and your father would say that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So every priest, in order to become a priest, after they're trained, they would wash them, they would bathe them, they would anoint with oil, and the father of this priest would, would recognize this as his beloved son. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came to Galilee, to Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, continue, uh, then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That this King of righteousness, we see Jesus said that this, what was happening was to fulfill all righteousness. That Jesus was baptized, he was emerged in water, that he was washed, that the, that the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came and, and rested upon him, speaking of the anointing, that he was anointed. And then there was a voice that said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. How old was Jesus? 30. This was his inauguration as high priest. And it's easy to just overlook these things. That him becoming a high priest was to fulfill all righteousness, but him becoming a high priest was to be after the order of Melchizedek, a superior. Look at verse 8. In one case, tithes are received from mortal men, but in the other case, by one whom lives and is testifies. That he lives. Now, I don't believe the writer is saying that this Melchizedek is still alive. Right? I believe that he died. He, he, he was born and he died. But there was another Jewish fable at this time that said that he never died. And so what I believe the writer is doing is that he, he's taking this king priest, this, this, this well-known story at this time, 
and he's using something that they know as a way to explain who Christ is and that although Christ has died, he has rose from the grave and he forever lives. Like it's really simple when if you just listen to our writer as he is taking these Jewish fables and he is speaking truth to them. All he's doing, you go back in Jewish history, you'll see everything that he's speaking of, but he's giving it a proper interpretation. That's not true, but this is true. No, he's not Shem. He had no genealogy. And the, and the reason why he is a priesthood forever is because it, again, it doesn't say that he died, but Jesus comes and takes this priesthood and Jesus lives forever. So he's just unscrambling the eggs. Now, what do we do with this? Like that's the hard, <laughs> like, like this is so beyond our, our, our brains. We have to ask ourselves, okay, now what do we do this? What do we do with this? What does this mean? What do we need to understand here? And, and I believe simply we just need to understand the point. And, and, and we'll close with this. We just need to understand the point. We need to leave here today not under, understanding the point and not getting lost in the weeds, that this Jesus is both king and priest. Like, that's it. Jesus is king and he is priest. He is the only sovereign, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, that, that he is the God-man who is both God and man, him being God, the only mediator between God and man. And as a high priest, he has reconciled us to himself as God by the sacrifice of himself as man. Let me just read that again. And as the high priest, he has reconciled us to himself as God by the sacrifice of himself as man. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the clearest message of the gospel. We need to hold to the same things that the hearers of this letter needed to hold to, and that is the preeminence and the sufficiency of Christ. That Jesus surpasses all others, that's the preeminence, and that you and I, we can rest in him because he has done enough. That's the sufficiency. And that the gospel is, is, is this, is that the inferior is blessed by the superior. When you look at verse 7, it says, it is beyond the dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And that's where the gospel comes in, that the preeminence of Christ, him being the superior, is blessing the inferior. How? Through the gospel, him becoming a man, him living the perfect life, him dying a a death that's substitutionary in our place. And that you and I, the inferior, are blessed when we look to Christ, holding on to his sufficiency that he has done enough. That's what the writer is trying to tell this group of people. Stop looking to the the, the, the type. Stop uh, 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 Stop looking at the types and start looking to the anti type. Stop looking to the substance, the, the shadow, and look to the substance. Our call to repentance is found in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, while the promise to enter his rest, remember the sufficiency, the, 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 uh, the sufficiency of Christ, he has done enough. Therefore, the promise of entering his rest still stands. Let us fear lest any of you should seem to fail to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. The call is this, is that you and I need not to be dull of hearing. And we need to make sure that those around us understand what Christ Jesus has done. We need to turn 
uh, from our selfishness, from our self-righteousness, and turn to Christ because he is preeminent and he is sufficient. He is above all and in all, and that through him he has conquered the pains and the tyrannies of death. But we can only find this salvation by believing in him. It is only by believing in him, by trusting in him alone for your salvation. If you want to know if you're struggling with salvation and you want to know if you're saved, do you trust him? Is he enough? Is Jesus Christ enough? Has he done enough to please the Father? Or are you still trying to do something to make yourself pleasing to the Father? If you are still trying to do something, then you're saying that he is not enough. But once he is enough, what we're doing here today as we gather together today He's going to use this to grow those who believe that he's enough in holiness. If you're here today and you don't believe he's enough, you get nothing from what comes from the day. Absolutely nothing. You're not growing at all. But if you hold to the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, that he is enough, he has paid it all, all to him I owe. I'm available. Pastor Cal's available. Josh is available. Anyone that wants to talk to us, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask that your blessings be upon us as a church, as a congregation. We ask that you bless the, the meal that we are about to receive, the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for us. Lord, right now I pray that those who are are of this congregation that hosts to the preeminence and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. I pray that as they're preparing themselves to take this meal, Lord, that you grow them in holiness. And I pray this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.